Hi, I'm Tim Tyler, and this is a video about the virtues of adopting a memes eye view of cultural change. It wasn't until the 1970s, long after Darwin's discovery of evolutionary theory, that biologists started to become accustomed to the idea that it could be useful to look at evolutionary change from the perspective of individual genes. The idea is often attributed to William Hamilton. Richard Dawkins helped to popularise the concept in his 1976 book of the selfish gene. It is not obvious that it can be useful to think of genes as being selfish agents which have a point of view. Indeed, at first the idea was much misunderstood, with the very idea that genes might have a perspective or be selfish being mocked by those who didn't understand it. However, these days the validity of the genes eye view is really taken for granted by most evolutionary biologists. In a nutshell, the idea is that genes can usefully be thought of as agents who are concerned with their own reproductive success. They behave as if they want to become ancestors and adopt structures which facilitate this. There are a couple of different perspectives which help to explain how and why this is useful. One is game theory. It's possible to view the evolutionary process as a type of competition between the heritable elements that underlie different morphologies and strategies. The most successful genes are defined as being those that leave the most descendants. The common result is the appearance of design without a designer. This explains how genes come to adopt forms which help them to survive. It allows us to cash out talk of genes as agents with goals, desires and a perspective in more conventional causal language that drains all the teleology and agency out of the description. The other perspective has to do with human psychology. Human beings have a built-in mental apparatus that helps us to understand the behaviour of other agent-like systems by a process involving mentally putting ourselves in the other agent's shoes. Humans use a built-in model of themselves as a basis for this type of identification process. The system underlies both empathy and our imitation capabilities. The whole system is sufficiently flexible to allow for identification with agents with different goals, abilities and aptitudes. It is possible to identify with dogs, rodents and invertebrates, and doing so actually allows the brain to make better use of its architectural features to predict the behaviour of such systems. Interestingly, the same architecture is even useful for inanimate systems, if they have a goal-directed nature or represent an optimization process. So, for example, it is possible to imagine yourself as a ball rolling down a hill and imagine the path of steepest descent that you might take. The fact that evolution is an optimization process is what allows this technique to do useful work in the case of genes. Genes do not literally have goals, but they behave as though they want to reproduce themselves. This allows a goal-directed model to do useful work, which in turn allows the human built-in mental apparatus that I've just described to model these as goal-directed systems, thereby helping us to attain insights into the operation of genes by making efficient use of the strengths of our own minds. This then brings us to the memes eye view. Just as the genes eye view is useful, so the memes eye view is useful. This has long been appreciated by students of memetics, and the memes eye view goes back over 20 years, at least to Dennett's 1990 paper, Memes and the Exploitation of Imagination. However, the students of cultural evolution in academia appear to have play, paid insufficient attention to the work of the memeticists in this area, and are still mostly attempting to struggle along without this important idea. One rare exception to this is Stephen Shannon, who publicly called for the memes eye view to be more widely embraced in his presentation in the 2010 Culture Evolves conference. The memes eye view conjures up a picture of memes attempting to manipulate their environment for their own advantage. For example, a sociobiologist looking at a modern office might see humans using machines for their own advantage. However, the memes eye view suggests another perspective. In a mutualist symbiosis, each party typically attempts to control and manipulate the other one. So the memes are also manipulating the humans into creating more memes, and are often in competition with other memes which are striving to make use of the same human resources. For another example, consider mobile phones. The typical sociobiology perspective pictures humans using phones to promote their own ends, with employees and bosses at the phone company using the technology to promote their own ends. The memes eye view of this setup looks rather different. The memes are using the human bodies of the users as sophisticated data capturing devices and world manipulators. Giving on-screen instructions to humans allows the memes to take advantage of sophisticated actuators made using molecular nanotechnology, while cameras, microphones and keyboards allow for data input. The data is then fed to a server-side computer system, which acts rather like a large and sophisticated brain which manages the entire setup. 
the whole system is arranged so as to promote and perpetuate the mobile phone company's means at the expense of the means of its competitors. Looking back at the timeline of, hu of human evolution, one of the first objectives for the means would have been to make room for themselves in human brains. They did this by rewarding the humans with more space for memes with increased genetic fitness. Memes for language, music and fashion were probably mainly, mainly responsible for this. The result was three million years of steadily expanding human cranial capacity, which resulted in much more space for the memes. Meme reproduction requires sociable humans, so those humans who interacted more with other humans would have been rewarded by the memes. The result of this was human ultra-sociality. Humans and their memes then developed spoken language, an adaptation which can be used for spreading memes. They also developed a taste for group chanting, which allows meme trans transmission with redundancy and error correction. Next, the memes increased human numbers, since the more humans there are, the more memes there are. Agricultural memes allow humans to form closer symbiotic relationships with plants, animals and each other's, which boosted their fitness and increased their numbers. The result was a massive increase in the worldwide population of memes. The next problem for the memes was transmission fidelity. At this early stage, most memes were copied using behavioural imitation, which provides very little in the way of copying fidelity. Environmental inheritance proved to be the answer here. By inventing the idea of writing, memes could persist unaltered across extended periods of time. And then there was the copying speed problem. Transcribing documents by hand was slow and tedious. However, the invention of mechanical printing presses allowed machines to take over this task from humans, resulting in much more rapid meme production and a vastly wider distribution of the resulting memes. Today, many memes still need the consent of a human brain to get copied, an obvious bottleneck from their perspective. The affected memes are currently busy sorting this issue out. Today, only a few parasitic computer viruses manage to reproduce themselves while skipping over the human brain com completely. However, in the future, superintelligent machines seem likely to copy memes with the full consent of society. To close, I would like to propose that the memes I view is one obvious landmark to use for gauging the process of academics in developing their understanding of cultural evolution. Academic study of cultural evolution has now fairly clearly made it past the Darwin stage and also the Fisher stage. However, it still appears to be somewhere around 100 years behind the study of organic evolution. Since cultural evolution seems unlikely to produce a Mendel or a Watson and Crick any time soon, the question arises of how best to measure the process of academia in its understanding of how culture evolves. The memes I view seems to provide a fairly suitable yardstick. At the moment, the penetration of the memes I view in academia is fairly clearly at an extremely low level. I think that places academia somewhere before the state of evolutionary theory in the 1970s. This metric suggests that academics still have a considerable way to go in developing their understanding of how culture evolves. There's more about the memes I view in my memetics book, which is available now. And looks like this. Um, so, enjoy!